Okay, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to this third Australian Flying Facebook Live. Coming to you from Melbourne. This is, uh, as I say, our third one. Our second one was on, I've got my license, what next? And someone mentioned at that uh, event that we didn't have instructing as an option. So tonight we're going to cover all about being an instructor. And we've got a fantastic panel of instructors assembled to speak with you this evening and answer your questions. My name's Paul Southwick. I'm joined by uh, Steve Hitchin, the editor. Uh, good evening, Steve. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, everyone. The, uh, the uh, event this evening, uh, the way we're going to do it is um, after the introductions, I'll hand over to Steve and Steve will uh, ask instructors some questions, sometimes for all of the instructors, sometimes maybe for one, and there'll be a chance for other instructors to jump in if they would like to. And also we will look at um, Facebook and take questions from the audience. And if someone asks a very good question tonight, then there's an opportunity to uh, win a Garmin watch, which we have available from our sponsors, Garmin. Uh, I can see that Marlon has joined us tonight. So um, one change to our uh, membership of our team. Uh, Abby wasn't able to make it tonight. And so Marlon, who's a uh, grade one instructor and head of operations in Melbourne is going to stand in for her. All right, Steve, I'm gonna pass over to you uh, to start the uh, questions for the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I guess my first question I've got to the panel uh, could be framed as basically, who are you? So let's go around the board as I see it at the moment and just get each one of you, if you can, um, to introduce yourselves and, and what your role is in the instructing uh, in aviation. And they'll start off with, with Linda. Hi, thanks, Steve. Uh, yep, I'm a Chief Flying Instructor with an RA Flying School at the Bendigo Flying Club, so based at Bendigo Airport. Um, I've been there for about five years uh, doing instructing, following a long time role in uh, recreational flying. So um, currently working with a team of five other instructors and uh, teaching RA. Beautiful, thank you. I seem to remember you also have some link to Antarctica or something like that, don't you? I do, yes. Um, <laughs> having, uh, having done a trek to the North Pole and the South Pole in a former life, yeah. <laughs> love and adventure. <laughs> so you've settled down to a nice, quiet life of teaching people to fly very small aeroplanes. That's it. That's it. Much, yeah. much more quiet. <laughs> okay. Amy. Amy, tell us about yourself. Hi, thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, so my name's Amy. I am currently living in Sydney, so I instruct out of Bankstown, um, instruct with Pacific Flight Services in at Bankstown. Um, I've actually been offline for about six months. I've just had a baby, so um, yeah, have been off since 30 weeks pregnancy, um, but prior, prior to that was actually instructing right up until then. Um, yeah, so look, I do, I'm a grade two instructor, GA, um, and I do also hold my RA um, instructor rating as well. So I am, haven't been instructing, like I said, for about six months, and I'm definitely itching to get back to it. <laughs> Good on you. Thanks for sparing the time to come in tonight. No worries. Thank you. Shelley Ross. Shelley Ross is, um, so I'm a relatively new instructor, only five years into it, but um, so I'm grade three instructor up at Ward Air at Bathurst. Um, and we've got, um, uh, I, I, I preceded that with a lot of years um, of private flying before I became an instructor. So um, I'll get onto that very, very tricky subject a bit later. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, commercial in 2000 and instructing in um, 2016. And uh, so, yeah, grade three up at Bathurst. And, and I spend most of our, our, my instructing time in the, in the outback. We, we take trips of students around the outback various lengths of time and um, sometimes calling into um, one particular um, regional town in New South Wales for a regular stint of about a, a week. So my my work is in blocks and in between my blocks of work, yeah. I'm a really, really good gardener. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, Charlie, you've got a really interesting story to tell. So I want to come back to that later on regarding the way water air works. Alex. Hi. You're the out. Um, your, your wings move. Sorry. Your wings move. <laughs> they do. So, yeah, above me. Um, yes, I'm a, a helicopter instructor in uh, Melbourne Helicopters. Been there for about four years now, and I've been instructing four years as well. 
and um, yeah, grade two. I don't know if I just said that, um, but I started with a team of just um, two instructors and now we're a team of six instructors. So we're steadily growing, um, mainly working on uh, our flying piston aircraft. Yeah. So you're talking to Robinson R44? Yep, and uh, well, we, we have a Cabri G2, that's our new fleet. So um, we don't yeah. do Robinson 22s anymore, but um, yeah. Yeah. Marlon, good day. Hey, how are you? I'm well, thanks, mate. Thanks for coming in tonight. Um, tell us a bit you know, about what you're doing. Yeah, I'm Mar my name is Marlon Balasuria. I'm a grade one multi RFI instructor. I've been in the industry for, for a bit now. I've worked for multiple organizations, especially, um, mostly in Victoria. Um, and also being the head of operations for one of the organizations um, recently. So, um, yeah. Very good. Right. Thanks. For and, he's, and he's the most patient man in Australia because he did my instant rating. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, Paul and I both have a few um, questions to throw uh, up at you tonight. So, I'm going to go kind on you and I'm going to let Paul go first. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, this is a, a one that could go anywhere, really. So I'll just throw it to the team, maybe in the same order, and tell us a little bit about your typical day. I know there is no typical day, but tell us a bit about a typical day instructing. Um, if I'm the one to go first, because I started first last time, I just yeah. at this time of year, summer in inland Victoria, we get up early and start uh, as early as we can because it gets really hot during the day. So we are often flying at about 7.30 or 8, uh, taking the first students up. Might have two, three, four lessons, uh, but then there's often a bit of a pause during the middle of the day when it just gets lumpy and horrible. Uh, and then towards the evening, we've got then another sort of set of flying. So a lot of our work's ab initio. A lot of the work is uh, going out to the training area and doing effects of controls, maybe doing circuits, I'm not tired of circuits yet, even though I have done hundreds of them. <laughs> um, then there's also the NAVs. So, you know, sometimes we get people who come in after work and we're doing a, a bit of a NAV training session. Um, we, don't, we don't run courses, uh, so we're not doing so much theory work with uh, the students, but we do sit down with them and talk to them about the exams coming up and how best to study and sort of help them tackle the different questions that they've got. Um, so it's a combination and thrown in amongst that with the students, I suppose, would be the trial flights because we get quite a few trial flights and a uh, good percentage go on, but not all. So the trial flights with the absolute brand new person who's never been for a flight before necessarily. So um, a, a unique flight of its own. Thanks, Linda. Who was, ne who was next to the order? I've forgotten. Oh, me? Sorry, myself. <laughs> um, look, uh, as a contractor um, out of Bankstown, I guess a typical day, you know, for me can be very different from a day to day um, perspective. So, you know, look, there may maybe some days where I'll have a student in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, other days, you know, there might just be the one student in the morning. And I mean, you know, I do range, you know, flying from, um, yeah, effective controls all the way to NAV. Um, as well so yeah so look it's so I, I'd say you know instructing is a very um, flexible feast and you know it's 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 definitely something that is um, you know uh, it gives you great flexibility so I am able to basically structure my day the way I want it to go um, and you know coordinate that with my students of course I can jump in if you like Good, Next. good, Shelley. Yep. Yep. Um, because a lot of our instructing is done um, on on trips, we are we are we're, we're moving every day. So um, I um, I don't I don't really know how many people I'm going to be uh, to be instructing. Whereas I might have one or two students in an aeroplane with me, swapping between between the, the the front seat and the back seat. While one's in the back seat, they're learning almost you know just as much as the one sitting in the left hand seat in, in the front. We might have 12, 12 people at the beginning of the day getting a briefing about what we're going to do that day. So we all then dispatch onto uh, in, in, into, into our um, individual aircrafts and off we go. So if I, um, if, and, and, that, and that is probably the bulk of, of my sort of flying and, and that will all 
that, that will therefore always, always be naving with um, a, a good dose of airmanship and CTA procedures if we're going through um, con controlled airspace. And then if I'm ever stationed at Bathurst or stationed up at Coonabarra Brown, where we go for a week every, every month or so, then it will be just the, the, the typical taking a bunch of students who get to see us once every month. And so wherever they're up to, it's, I don't do many TIFFs up there. It'll be, okay, this guy's up to turning. Okay, he's up to, you know, circuits now. She's, she's up to her first nav. Okay, it's time for this guy to go to controlled airspace. We take them over to Tamworth. So it's a, it's a real mix and it's pretty full on in one, in, in, a, in a day, there might be, you know, at least five, five flights to do. So no shortage of variety in my, in my sort of instructing. <laughs> Alex, why don't you go next? And because I live uh, one minute flying from Essendon, I know what time that your helicopters start flying. So perhaps, <laughs> yes. you, could, perhaps you could include that in your talk. Of course. <laughs> much um, to my delight, I might say, because I love seeing them. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. You're uh, one of the few. Um, yeah, we uh, have just, due to COVID, recently structured our day to start at 6.30 and end at 6.00. So our first lesson is from 6.30 to 8. Um, there's a restricted amount of things that you can do in that time. Like you can't really go and do circuits at Moorabbin. You can't go and do hovering on the Eastern grass because that'll, um, yeah, the neighbors won't be very happy. So we end up going flying, uh, just uh, doing, you know, turns or, or autos or um, from height to height. Um, but we have a very structured day. So the fir first lesson is 6.30 to 8, and then 8 to 10, 10 to 12, 12.30 or 12 to 12.30, we have a lunch, and then um, 12.30 to 2.30, 2.30 to 4.30, and then 4.30 to 6. So uh, we are, because we're four instructors on a daily basis, it's kind of nice to um, have maybe a two hour uh, break where we get to do some paperwork, but more often than not, all of us are flying um, most of the time. And it's always varied. So um, you could do hovering or emergencies or ab initio because we do, um, uh, we teach anywhere from PPL and CPL. Don't do a lot of RPLs um, because there's not a lot of time difference between RPL and PPL. But uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how um, I think for me, uh, I often get a lot of students who are in the same uh, kind of time frame of their license um, at the same time. So you get essentially four uh, lessons of just hovering, which uh, can be <laughs> very entertaining. Uh, the slide circuits. Look at it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, yeah, it, it, is, it, it is a very varied day, but um, you, we do have a structure, which is quite nice actually. Um, to have a little bit of, I guess, prediction of, of how to lay out your day. Thanks very much. And Marlon, what's your typical day? Is it multi <laughs> instrument instructor, yeah? Yeah, look, my day mostly um, depends on what clients need um, as well. Um, you know, sometimes I get clients who want to fly 8 a.m. on Sunday morning or someone else available for a sim you know, 7 to 10 p.m. on Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening. So it all depends on that, um, actually. But my best day would be to do um, a couple of uh, initial lessons and uh, probably IFR now to start, uh, finish with, you know, that probably be a, a good day for me, if I think. Can I just add that I'm sure there's, um, we, a lot, I just noticed that almost most of us, maybe Alex mentioned it briefly, um, there is a lot of paperwork that goes with our two days. I'm sure yes, all yeah. of you would agree. Good point, good point, Amy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I know we often think, you know, the flying bits, the fun bit, and let's just forget about it. But unfortunately, it's the inevitable that it's got to be done. So, Absolutely. I yeah, couldn't agree more. And that's why, like, also uh, when we do have, a, for example, an 8 a.m. start, we really um, need students to be there at 8 because yeah. Uh, yeah. you do, you know, a half hour brief or 40 minute brief, depending on if they need an air exercise brief or a long brief, yeah. then the flight can be anywhere between 40 minutes to an hour and a half. And where do you get time to debrief and do the paperwork by the time the next student comes in? Absolutely, yeah. It sounds, um, like, sounds like medical yeah. doctors or specialists to me. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, 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 it's, and, and it's really bad news if you if you don't get time to do to you know to write up what you know a student's report mm. or something because you think oh god you know what did we do with her and if you've done three or four students and you wait a couple of days you, you know you've got Buckley's chance of remembering so it's kind of, it kind of keeps you on your toes. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was the easy. That was the easy question from Paul. Now, Steve, you've got some <laughs> questions you'd like to ask on behalf of the read on behalf of the readers, of course, Steve. Let's get <laughs> into this. Um, I will uh, direct this sort of at everyone, but I'll address it initially to Linda. Um, Linda, you would at some time in your instructing career have taken over a student from another instructor somewhere along the line, someone coming through the school who'd been somewhere else and so forth. Um, having done that, do you find that there is a consistency out there between um, instructing procedures and standards? Uh, the, there is a consistency, but there's certainly some different techniques and strategies I find. So uh, if we pick up a student from a different flying school, you can find yourself uh, dealing with quite different ways of approaching the same things that you normally would teach. So one of the one of the key issues for a flying school is to make sure there's consistency within its instructors. So that's something that we work at really hard on. And I'm, you know, pretty comfortable with how that works at the Bendigo Flying Club that when I work with a student that's been flying with another instructor there, I know what they've heard, I know what they've been told, I know what they're trying to do and their strategy for achieving each of the different parts of the task. But I must say I have been surprised at times at how people approach their flying. Um, yeah. Mostly I find that when I'm doing a BFR for somebody who is not, you know, hasn't come through our structure, um, and I go, oh, so, you, okay, we can actually do it that way, can we? <laughs> I learn a lot <laughs> about different ways of approaching things. Um, I don't find people come through with unsafe ideas on the whole. A couple of times that's happened, but um, just some very different ideas about how to make the, the machine work. So, um, yes, it can be a bit of an eye-opener. And I, for BFR, I will try and adapt to what they know because I don't need to reteach them. Yeah. I just need to make sure they're safe and that what they're doing is effective. And so then I need to adapt to that. So it's a very interesting learning process when you are working with someone who's learned to fly elsewhere. Yeah. Marlon, can I get you to jump in on that one too? Do you find something similar to Linda? Uh, yeah, you look, um, I mean, look, I've got many experience with, the, with many students um, having um, as much like what Linda said um, about different techniques of doing the same thing, especially into the landing phase and all that. Um, look, it, 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 it's it's difficult. Like sometimes, I mean, I don't know, I heard instructors say, look, you know, it's a bad student or uh, hard to work with and all that. But I always try to look the other way around saying, look, what method should I be using to reach this person or make him understand or her understand this technique? So it's a bit of an art to it, if I say, um, but um, look, you know, I think overall instructors doing the best they can, most of them doing the best they can. Um, yeah. But that's something we need to work on continuously. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Does something happen in the rotary world, Alex? Um, well, not, oh, yeah, it's a hard question to answer. I completely agree with Linda in that there hasn't been any unsafe, uh, unsafe ideas, but there have been, um, people who do things a little bit differently and then when we're trying to create a little bit of a consistent you know um uh i guess lesson then uh, you battle primacy a little bit so you have to uh for example radio calls um that was actually a very recent example of someone who did their um, commercial license and the examiner commented on their radio calls but that was one thing that we really struggled to teach them because uh, in that other school they had done 50 hours so mm. 50 hours of doing one way of radio calls it's really hard to unlearn and learn a new um mm. new system yeah. even though radio calls should be consistent so i don't know why that was an issue um yeah. but yeah it's yeah different yeah, yeah. It can be different okay paul um my next question is more on the funny side, and I did tell everybody I'd ask this question, and I know that Marlon will have one funny story about one of his IFR students, but I wanted to ask, um, have any, that, have any, is it have warnable any, somewhere, Paul? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you can tell it. Um, does, does everybody have like a funny or an interesting story or a little incident or something that happened that they, without naming their student or something funny that happened that they could tell us about? Yeah, maybe Marlon, I'm happy to be embarrassed. You can start first. <laughs> uh, any of the other any of the other stories? <laughs> uh, this is one of the one of the um, 
one of the good students I had. So uh, <laughs> now just um, yeah, look. Oh, well, still <laughs> tell you the story. Um, we went and completed some air work IFR at Warrnambool, and then uh, we were uh, on our way back or just departing Warrnambool after after everything to come back to Morabin and my students say like, um, how long before we reach Morabin? And I'm like, okay, you tell me then. And he's like, he calculated and he's like, look, Marlon, it's going to take me this many minutes and I don't think I can hold that long. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we had to go back and, so, you know, it was a bit of a, uh, yeah, conversation with the, with the center asking, uh, they asking us if everything okay. And we were like, yep, you know, just nature calls, so. <laughs> <laughs> but everything happened without a problem after that. All good. <laughs> and the funny thing is, all things happen for a reason. We decided to refuel, and on our way back, we got massively delayed. And we think, well, just as well we stopped for an eight to call, went back for yeah. an eight to call because we had more fuel, which which was good. <laughs> all right, who else has got a funny story? Oh, I'll ju- I can jump in. There is uh, over the past, um, well, just since I started flying to. To my joy, I've um, I've had quite a few 15 and 16 year old boys in the left hand seat, seat with me. Mm, teenagers, you know, they're one of God's special special creatures, aren't they? Really? Yeah, I've had three of those, and really, there's nothing that the last 12 years of therapy hasn't fixed. So I'm fine in that regard. And so and so they have they have this um this the, the economy with words when they when they talk, and I think that we'd all agree that there, there needs to be quite a lot of communication between your students and yourself. And what do we get? We get the grunts, and we get the one word answers, and we we don't waste a lot of energy, you know, making full sentences for heaven's sake. We just go with the occasional word thrown out and we're supposed to know what 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 they think and uh and you know like i i remember saying saying to say no i didn't say it i just thought it to this really young 15 year old who i i I adore them all don't get this next segment wrong but they do make me laugh and you know i i i we don't know what they're thinking and so when we're looking at a windsock and he chooses the, the the tailwind wind runway i would have i would have loved to have known what was going on in his head <laughs> why, why he chose that you know please you know share 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 with me tell me all your inner thoughts now that's getting a bit creepy but just you know i i, I like response and i don't get it from them so I, I worked out quite a long time ago to, to get them out of the aeroplane and start walking back to the briefing room. And I just have to take off my instructor hat and put my mother's hat on. And when we get to that situation, believe me, it's time to get scared. <laughs> and I, and I just think, right, now, we just need to have a little chat about communicating. This will only take about half an hour, but I'll tell you what, after that half an hour, they are the best students in the world best students in the world but it all comes down to as as a few were saying you know in in the last segment um knowing your personalities you know who's sitting next to you and the best way to best way to get through to them you know but we're not mind readers and we have to we have to know what's what what they're thinking and if they're not understanding anything i i i love people just to ask ask questions yeah so yes me and the teenagers it's funny that you say that, Shelley, with the asking questions, because some of the questions I get, I'm like, how how does that even occur? Like I was um, flying and uh, with a student and we were learning or I was teaching him calming and ascending. And he asked me, oh, can I cross the road? And I went only if you looked both ways. And we were like a thousand to <laughs> one thousand five hundred feet above above everybody. Yeah? But uh, yeah, just some of the questions just like, are you for real? Where did that come from? Yeah, exactly. Like, can I cross the road? Um, Yes. Is that a trick question? (laughs) Uh, I've actually found the challenge for me is to be able to express what I want to say so clearly. Yeah. Because if if I make any assumptions about their knowledge or if I'm a bit at all vague, uh, so just... You know, I've had to become so much more precise. <laughs> I agree, Linda. Yeah. That's a, I, I agree with you. That's tough. That's tough to do that. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. That also um, got, falls into another funny story where um, my um, chief um, flight instructor, when he was working down in Moorabbin, it's not my story, but um, I think I'm allowed to tell it. He was uh, doing an approach into the tower pad or into the pad. And um, he was expecting to be able to make the pad, but they were in an order when there you kind of have to manage the energies in a way that not necessarily like you always um, end up where you were expecting. 
and he looked at the pad and he goes, we're not going to make it. <laughs> and um, yeah, the guy sitting next to him just went white. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and they landed and he looked over and he's like you're right mate and then yeah they had a little moment of um oh i'm really sorry <laughs> so what i meant see so, yeah. um, you're not gonna make it <laughs> yeah. can you funny. imagine what about you amy you must have had a few funny incidents in your time um oh, i'm trying to rack my brains of one to tell <laughs> um I did have, I, I remember this, um, quite, it was quite funny because it just took me by surprise. Like, I mean, we were nabbing, um, I remember, with a student um, who I am actually quite good friends with and I do I do like to sort of um, get to know my students on a deeper level, um, if you know what I mean, not, not in any romantic way. <laughs> Um, but you know like their interests and you know that sort of thing so I was um so anyway so I was navving out to Canberra with him and on this occasion um we were um yeah so we were just going along and he was doing a perfect job with navving you know I was I was pleasantly um surprised you know it was only his I think it might have been his first nav actually to Canberra and he he actually did really well um but I was sort of looking at the time and I thought, oh, you know, I've really got to get back. I've got another student. And, you know, I, you know, I um, had mentioned that before we departed that, you know, we've only got this amount of time. Um, but he actually decided to, instead of, um, you know, us landing and then um, pre-flying the plane again and then turn around to go back, he actually disappeared on me. And it was, um, he, he just disappeared and said, I need to go to Lou. So I said, okay, no worries. So I waited and waited. Um, and it was just a, such a long time that I thought, oh my goodness, we're going to run out of daylight for starters. <laughs> I better go looking for him. And so when I, when I finally found him, he was actually, he had actually bought himself a packet of chips from the vending machine. I was sitting there eating it rather than, <laughs> rather than actually saying, you know, rather than, you know, as a matter of urgency, we're going to run out of daylight, we're going to get back. So I said to him, look, I said, look, this is um, starting to get serious. It's not really that funny anymore because if we run out of daylight, we're going to be somewhere like Goulburn or something, you know, for the night. Um, which Whoa. is not something, <laughs> not something I want to do, but anyway. So, yeah, so we both had a bit of a chuckle and I, and I sort of said to him, look, you know, um, you do need to be aware of your um, last light and, I mean, it's not up to, you know, obviously as an instructor, um, I'm watching the time, but if you were to do this on your own, um, yeah, so I think it was a bit of a chuckle kind of learning experience for, for him. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think because, of, you know, I can be a bit sort of, um, I guess I, I'm a new mum, but even before that, I, I, <laughs> I can turn into a tiger mum with my students. Um, and I think he was sort of expecting me to, growl at him and be like what are you doing eating chips and I was just sort of looked at him and thought oh my god face palm <laughs> you, so didn't, anyway. you didn't go into the lack of nutritional content in the chips or well, anything. yeah well I was thinking that I thought oh my gosh you know you didn't you didn't pack yourself anything there's your apple there's your apple I reckon in like 20, 20 or 30 years' time, you'll be a captain on what sort of aeroplanes we have and you'll be talking to young students and you'll say, let me tell you how I learned all about, you know, uh, nighttime and all that sort of stuff and end of daylight time. Yeah, yeah exactly right. <laughs> that, um, that packet of chips story reminds me of, I don't know if you, you guys have ever, have ever done that, put the, put the packet of chips up on top of the dashboard of the aeroplane to talk, to talk about air, air pressure as you're climbing. Oh yes. Oh yeah, it's groovy. So up go and and we had once again some teenagers on the on the on the flight. And they said, "Can we do that? Can we do that packet of chips thing? Can we do that packet of chips thing?" So, <laughs> so the packet of chips goes on top on top of the dashboard, and I always call it a dashboard, not a cow, because I just want to call it that. Um, so it goes it goes up there, and then of course as you rise, the packet of chips gets fatter and fatter and fatter mm. and the boys are just in hysterics in hysterics waiting for it to burst i said is there any chance we could possibly keep our eye on height and heading or is it just <laughs> all about the packet of chips about to burst come on <laughs> well i reckon we could be here all night on this topic so as as one of the organizers i'm going to pass to steve steve you might have a more serious question i don't know but i think we need to move on no way have I got a more serious question. <laughs> okay. 
I just wrote a new one down. So yeah, oh, good. Oh, go ahead. Got to be hysterical, doesn't it? This one is directed specifically at Shelley, but I'd like to get uh, some other input too. Shelley, in the in the articles you used to write for Australian Flying, particularly the Reach for the Sky series and so forth, when you're doing your CPL and when you did the uh, controlled airspace article down here in uh, in Melbourne, you used to complain a lot about the dirty tricks that instructors would pull on you. Did I? <laughs> no. Always complaining and wanting to beat up instructors with blunt instruments all the time. Yes. I guess the question I've got for you now is now that you're in the other seat, mm -hmm. okay, are you pulling the same dirty tricks on your students? No, no. I'm certainly, I'm certainly not because I have got the, the greatest respect for how, um, I don't think I'm intimidating, but just because they're the student in a learning situation, I've got the greatest respect in the world for how, um, how inadequate they might be feeling. Right. And so I think if I can get them through the lesson and, and, and have them feeling really good about themselves, mm. then that's my number one aim. And it's, mm. you know, and I'm not being schmaltzy that it's just because I have a, I, I have a memory of how wound up I used to be and, and mm. how terrified I used to be that, I, that I'm thinking if, if you can just get the blood pressure down on your student, mm. then they're going to perform a lot better. So I'm, I'm not a nasty one. I'm, yeah. I'm not a nasty one. Um, and I think that maybe a few stories, a few, a few non-facts got in the way of a good story back in the day. Steve, do you think that could have happened with my writing? I don't know. There was one of them specifically you spoke about at the time with an instructor from Moorabbin who you uh, know very well and, and flew into Essendon with, told you to plan outbound off um, runway 17 at Essendon planning a right-hand turn and out through Rockbank when uh, runway 34 was active at Melbourne. Not telling you, of course, that you never get that clearance. <laughs> no one ever gets that clearance. <laughs> oh, we'll see. You to completely replan at the holding point. Oh, God. It's a wonder that guy's still alive. Give me his number. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, what, what about you? Do you have little things that you like to do to students just to... to teach them and I'm talking about um, malicious things like you know, I know one instructor was very 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 good at pulling out the um, undercut circuit breaker light and things like that without you noticing uh, particularly in the arrow where you could just pull out the globe when um, yeah. Yeah. you know um, you have I, ha I haven't done much of that at all because I again like Shelley find that if we've got a fear factor going on in the cockpit, that we don't have much learning going on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost the opposite of going, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Um, so even when there are surprises, but maybe the one thing is that if they have been told about putting their uh, fuel pump on many times before takeoff and they fail, then sometimes we do have an engine failure on takeoff that occurs and they don't forget after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that you know, that would be the one thing. Maybe um, I don't, I don't provide them with answers though. And I think you've heard that before here. That if they get to a point where they're saying, "So what do I do?" You know, which direction is Ben to go home? It's like, okay, well, how are you going to work that out? You know, mm -hmm. how do we sort this? So um, it's a supportive relationship, but it's uh, it does challenge um, just through the nature of what we're doing. Mm. What about Alex? I'd like to hear from you on that one. Oh, well, from what you mentioned, it sounds like we have the same tricks. So uh, if um, you know that someone's not checking their, you know, T's and P's and warning lights, then you pull the circuit breaker mm. um, and all of the, you know, fuel and um, temperatures and pressures, the needles go to zero. Mm. Um, so it might take a few moments for the students to realize. Um, there's also uh, one where you know the fuel shutoff valve on the on the pre-flight, but it's it's before you start up. So if you don't check that the fuel shutoff valve is on, then um, we can turn it off. And and when you start, the engine runs for a couple of seconds, then and then fails. Mm. Um, so I've never had to do that one, luckily, because all my students follow the checklist rig rigorously. But um, yeah. I know of instructors who've done that before. Mm. One of the really nasty ones, though, is um, which I've never done and I, um, I think is dangerous is chopping the throttle. Mm. So uh, um, in, the, in the chopper, if you don't lower their collective uh, within a few seconds, then um, your blades can stall. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it was back in the old days, it was very popular to do throttle chops to check if the student was ready. But, um, and I've had that done to me a couple of times and I don't think that that's right. But, you know, it's like Linda said, um, you, you don't give answers. So yeah. um, there are little things like that that uh, you can do use as a, like a learning, learning mm. opportunity. How about you, Matt? I'm the CFR I've just... probably got a few. Can I, I just want to jump in. I actually want to ask Marlon a question. Are we allowed to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's because um, I, I feel like it's Brady Bunch anyway, and I can just look down here and there's Marlon. Um, Marlon, what do you do when um, if, if a student hops in with you and and just has no intention whatsoever of, of using a checklist? Are you fairly um, well? You'd be wary about that. Would you be insisting upon it, or would you just inquire why they're not? Well, why they're not using a checklist? Uh, uh, does that worry you too much? Oh, it, it does actually. And um, I mean, I believe the checklists are, you know, there. There's a reason why there's it, there's a checklist, mm -hmm. and if you don't follow the checklist, that's nothing happens. So, so mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll be hundred percent insisting on it, and um, you know, probably we have a, I don't know, brief the student again um, on that one, and you know, probably. Uh, to a point that we might cancel the flight and start again yeah. uh, on another day. Yeah. So yeah. There, there are things in aviation that you must follow. That's what I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th you can't discount those ones. Yep. So yep. that's the thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Paul, back to you. Okay. I'd just like to go backwards actually, because um, this is something that I think all the readers would love to know is how did each of you get into, into instructing? How did you get bitten by the instructing bite? You know, is it something you always wanted to do? Did you get into it by accident? Um, how, did, how did each of you get into instructing? It'd be really interesting just to hear briefly your stories as to how you became instructors. Uh, for me, it was definitely by accident in that I got into flying by accident too, really. I just started having lessons going, I wonder if I can do this. And I had a trial flight and then I said, oh, I wonder if I can do a bit more. So I just kind of meandered into it um, and flew recreationally for probably 15 years before doing anything else. So I started with the PPL, then I converted to RAOs because I found the planes were cheaper to hire. Um, and I was in a position of changing jobs, changing careers in a way. Uh, the flying instructing course came up and I said, well, I'll just have a go, see if I can do this. Um, I've actually found that's been the best thing for my flying ever to do instructing because it's meant that I've had to get to know what I'm doing at a much greater detail. The ability to explain it all means I have to know it really well. Um, I get so much practice on all the skills. So uh, even though somebody else is flying the plane, my flying has increased, you know, my flying skills have been increased enormously. So it is a bit by accident, but I am, am thoroughly appreciative of being in this role. Um, there's so many privileges of being sitting there with a student through all the different stages um, and helping them build their skills so that they get to the competent level. Um, it's such a big journey for each of, each of them as it was for me when I first did it. So um, it's an amazing thing to be able to do. Uh, so it's been great. Thanks, thanks, Linda. Who'd like to go next? How did you get into it? You want me to go? Yeah. Do it. Okay. Um, we. I'm. I'm. I'm thinking. I'm. I'm remembering the the um, the things that were involved were probably a really big dose of insanity, a vat <laughs> of wine, and a couple of very mischievous aviation mentors who thought it was going to be a really good idea and really good fun to watch me go go through this torture, but. It, it had been 16 years um, since I'd done my commercial. So it was, um, for me, it, I, I, and I had just been doing private flying and, and working on the magazine all those, all those years. And I just thought it might, it might develop my skills. And certainly, as Linda said, a depth of knowledge much deeper than what you had before, which you need to be able to teach it. And I thought that would be really good for my for my private flying. And um, I was also away flying on a on a, on a three week um, writing and flying gig with with Casa doing the first of their I think it, 
the second of their out and back series and we were, we were out bush and and Catherine who is the CFI at Ward Air said um you know if and, and I'd already been doing flights all over Australia and and, and and we just thought we'd team up with both our outback experience and she said it'd be a lot a lot funner if you had a student next to you so it kind of it just took on um we, I, I, I felt like I had a, a reason to learn and a, a use that I was going to put it to. I don't think I was ever going to be a go out to the airport and teach flying every, every day and, and, and go home. It was always going to be the, the outback um, thing involved in it. So that's how it, that's how it started. And it's, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever done. Hey, but so I love the way... I love the way all the stories are different and that's, I guess, a message we're trying to give the readers today of those who are thinking of instructing. There's no single way or single course of getting into getting into instructing. Uh, every, every way is the right way. Okay, who's going to go next? Oh, Amy? I can jump in if you like. Yeah, yeah thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so I have been flying for about 12 years now. Um, I actually started off... Um, so I started off in 2009 when I moved across the other side to the other side of the country. So I actually grew up in Perth and I moved to um, Canberra for um, after uni when I finished um, my, actually have a health background. So I actually finished my health science commerce degree and landed a job with the Department of Health in Canberra. So um, once I started working and I started earning some disposable income, it was a matter of, you know, what do I do with all this money? <laughs> Being a grad, I thought it was brilliant having all this extra money. And, and look, so it was really a matter of do I save it for a house or do I blow it on flying? Because I'd always wanted to, to fly um, as a kid, but mum and dad never approved. So I thought I'll start off um, just with one lesson out at Canberra Airport back. Back then, um, Brenda Bell Airlines um, was um, still around, and so I did a flying lesson with them, and um, and it was just meant to be a hobby. So I didn't actually tell mum and dad until I went for my first flight, and then I said, "Hey, God, hey, guess what? I, you know, done my first flight, and I want to continue because I love it." And they said, "Okay, sure, you know, as a hobby, all good." Um, so yeah, so I continued flying as a hobby, but um, and continued working the public service full time. But once a week flying really just wasn't enough for me, and you know like all of you would probably know um weather gets in the way um especially in canberra and i was probably getting only one flight every three months or so just with lessons being cancelled um aircraft in you know unavailable and weather and all that so i then um took 12 months off so after i finished my grad pro my graduate program um in Canberra, I took 12 months off and flew back to Perth to finish off my PPL. So, um, yeah, so what was a hobby? Um, I went back to Perth, finished it off, and my parents were like, all right, you've got your hobby now, back to work, back to Canberra, to the public service. Um, and I, ju I just couldn't, you know, like I, I just got the bug. And um, <laughs> and so um, so what I then decided was that I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop flying then in terms of lessons and I'll build up a bit of the kitty. So I actually did go back to Canberra to um, to work for three years. And so I actually took a bit, um, a big break between PPL and CPL and um, to build up my kitty because I didn't want to do, you know, didn't want to do the whole back and forth, back and forth um, with training. I wanted to be able to just go in full time and just get it done. So, um, so what I, yeah, so I did actually go back um, for three years and stop flying and in, um, in the three years, um, I actually discovered RAOs because I thought, you know, I, what I wanted to do was I still wanted to keep my hand in flying, but it's so expensive. Um, how can I keep my hand in it um, and still, you know, just, just have a bit of fun while, you know, building my kitty? So I was fortunate in that I joined the Canberra Aero Club um, and, you know, and, um, yeah, with them they were they want they were going to do a formation flying course so down at maria aero club so i thought well why not i'll go down with them and do a bit of a formation camp and um do my do a formation rating um with rao's aircraft so that was really good um and uh, sorry this is a bit long-winded as to how i got into instructing but while i was there at the maria aero club the chief flying instructor actually took an interest um in myself because i was um the only female uh, yeah, actually, I was the only female amongst the other men in the aero club who were down there for their formation flying weekend. And he took an interest in asking me 
um, you know, what do you want to do and, you know, where do you want to take your flying? And so I guess it was himself. So Graham White, who has passed away now, unfortunately, he was involved in an um, air, aircraft accident um, down in Maria um, in 2014 and, and died as a, as a result of the crash. Um, but fortunately, I was very fortunate to have him as my mentor and to actually talk to me about the option of, you know, where to next, because I I was sort of in between PPL and CPL and had no idea. So he kind of, you know, said, well, you know, the, these are the steps, you, you know, you can take. Um, and, you know, at the time, and I still would like to fly with the RFDS um, eventually. Um, and so he sort of guided me through that. So I think, for you know, for me... Um, for me, how I fell into it was he said he he did explain to me and said, look, you know, I feel like you would, um, you know, you would really enjoy instructing and you would make a good instructor. And um, otherwise, your other option is to do charter. You can um, do that as well. Um, but uh, but for me, when it came time, once when I finished my CPL, unfortunately, he had died before I finished my CPL. But once I finished my CPL, I thought, look. Um, I don't really know whether I want to do instructing or whether I want to do charter, but I'll. But given that Graham had given me that little bit of advice, let me give instructing a go, um, and you know, we'll see. You know, we'll see where that leads, and if if I don't like it, then I'll go charter. Um, and so, you know, I was actually really fortunate that on the day of my CPL ex, um, flight test, the, that morning or, or that day, they were running the. Um, they were going to start the instructor rating course. So. Um, with the school that I was at um, with actually I, I actually did my um, CPL with Pacific Flight Services so um, the my instructor at the time said look um, you know if you don't jump on this course it's another three months wait so I actually did my flight CPL flight test and thank goodness I passed that morning because then I jumped in and joined the instructing course that afternoon um, and look I haven't looked back since I think instructing is just fantastic I love um, the fact that my students are also different. I get, you know, a range of students from teenagers to um, businessmen, you know, professional, um, you know, doctors, you know, other professions. Um, I even learn about professions that I didn't even know existed, you know. And so some of my students are saying, I'm such and such. I'm like, oh, I didn't know, you know, you, you could, I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, yeah, so, so look, I, I think um, my takeaway, I guess, from my experience and what, you know, what I've been through is that it, it is, if you do come across a mentor, um, you know, grab that with both hands and really make use of their experiences and what they've got to share. Um, yeah, so that's been really valuable for me. And I think, um, you know, losing Graham was a really big hit, um, you know, it really hit me quite hard because, um, you know, we did spend a lot of time together, even with some night flying. Um, I don't know if you can hear my baby there. I can hear him screaming in the background. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, let him scream. <laughs> bring, it, bring him on because it'll probably raise the profile. There'll be another thousand people will come on and watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, so look, with, with Graham, you know, like he, I guess he inspired me to go beyond mm. just being someone's instructor, but also to be them to be their mentor to be their guide you know to to help them kind of um if they're lost with their career path to help them and guide them um you know i remember there'll be times where i i'm in canberra and he's down in maria so that's about two two hour drive or so i couldn't get out there and he would drive up on the weekends at night and you know and then do a light night flight with me and it'd be one two a.m in the morning and he'd be driving back you know, wow. and, you know, so he'd go just, you know, yeah, he would go out of his way to, you know, to make sure that I would be able to have um, that lesson that I, that I, you know, wanted to have. So very lucky. Um, you're very lucky. I was, yeah. yes, very lucky. And so look, I think for me, as a result of that, I, I try to go beyond just being an instructor and try to kind of, um you know, have a, have a more holistic approach. So, you know, where are you at in your life? Um, what sort of circumstances are you in? And, you know, financially as well and all that. And we'll try and make it work and try and help you achieve what you want to achieve. So, and Amy, also, that's that, that's good for them because you're not, you're, you, you're also looking after their finances. If, if they go off on a tangent and you think, well, there, there, there might be, a, you know, a better way to do things, you, 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 you need to have their economics. In yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, look, I, I get a lot of students that say crazy things to me, like they want to do this and that before 
before they do this. And, and I just say to them, look, what is your ultimate goal that you want to achieve? And then let's work from there and let's work backwards and see exactly what you need to do um, and just focus on what's required to get to what you need to achieve. And everything else is frills. You know, like I say to them, I often say to them, I'll try and provide you no frills so you can save money. <laughs> and then if you want to add on the frills later, then, you know, you can do that. So. Right. Okay. Uh, Alex, how did you get into instructing and where did you get into instructing? Where? Well, um, that's a very funny question. So um, I was 16 when I started flying initially and, uh, and then I was 19 when I got my commercial pilot's license. And um, in, as everybody knows, most uh, flight schools are um, privatized. So every flight school kind of pushes their agenda. And so uh, uh, I was kind of told, okay, there are three pathways to go. You either go into charter, you either get your IR and go offshore uh, in Aberdeen specifically, um, uh, or you um, go into instructing. Now, from my experience, I uh, always, all my instructors were much, much older than me because, um, of course, I got my uh, CPL when I was 19. So it was, it felt like a little bit overwhelming almost. And I almost felt like a fraud uh, if I was going to go into that extracting role um, that I didn't have enough experience. I, I didn't have uh, that guidance like up my sleeve and, and all that. So I went for my IR um, just when the oil prices fell through the floor and I felt really lost. Um, but then my boyfriend at the time, he was um, at the same age as me. We were both 22 at the time and he, um, he was an instructor. And uh, he kind of showed me that even though you're young, doesn't mean that uh, you don't have, um, you know, val value uh, and an experience to come, like to come to your students with. I think the, the most thing that like stopped me from going into instructing initially was um, it's really important for instructors to care about their students. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to bring that to the table. Um, but I was a kindergarten teacher, so I felt, what's the difference between teaching adults and teaching uh, three-year-olds? So uh, <laughs> I, um, I kind of went into it in Norway. And, uh, and in Norway, I, I was fortunate enough to, um, to get my um, flight instructor rating. And, uh, and then three months later, I, um, I rocked up on Chris's doorstep, Chris, who owns Melbourne Heli, and he, um, he gave me a job. And, uh, and so I kind of, as well as you, Linda, like almost kind of fell into it, um, but with a little bit of a push from my boyfriend at the time and my parents, because they, they really um, inspired me, like they, or they uh, supported me and, and told me that I would be a good instructor because I have the doubts of being a good instructor, if that makes any sense. Because um, I think a lot of, a few of my instructors, I'd, I've had, like 11 instructors and a couple of them um were incredibly selfish <laughs> and didn't care about me as a student so uh so i know what it feels like and uh, and i kind of bring that to the table as in like i don't want to be that person so i'm uh, i completely agree with amy like you want to kind of come to the table with a holistic approach and and make sure that your students are in a good place and um and so we, we often chat. I almost feel like I'm a psychologist in the helicopter because uh, a lot of things come out when, uh, when you're flying from A to B or when you're it, it's stuck in that environment with someone. You see, you are just like doctors. I was right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Marlon. <laughs> Marlon, you've gone you know, right through to the head of operations. So you sort of had many levels of going through instructing. Um, tell us about how you got into instructing and how you sort of made those moves through the grades, you know? Sure, look, it's not as um, exciting as other stories, unfortunately, but um, when I finished my CP uh, CPL um, in Moorabbin um, and I was sort of, uh, you know, trying to decide whether I want to do my instructor rating or do the instru instrument rating and go up north, um, you know, find a charter gig. Um, and then um, I decided to do instructing um, because it's, you can, are hoping to you know stay in Melbourne, um, and it, look, it worked out all right. You know, you got a first job in Ballarat, and um, you know, basically spent five years there, five and a half years, just went through the ranks, got my ratings and um, all that, whatnot. And um, yeah, so look, more I spent time instructing, more I started to like it. Um, I didn't wasn't particularly in love with it 
before I started uh, instructing. And um, one of the good things, like uh, you, Alex, um, sort of touched on it as well. But um, you, you know, you know how you know about your experience. You you know how you were taught by your instructors. And what I was going to always do, it still do, is like try to get the positive experience through to the to the, to my students, and then. Um, just avoid the negatives and uh, you know as anyone we've been through good and bad ones um, and um, you know we try to um, just pass through the positives all the time hmm. yes yeah we call it the <laughs> shit sandwich right the, the shit sandwich <laughs> one other thing or one other element of it for me was that it, I I was looking forward to it, but I also had a bit of fear about what was I was I going to be able to handle what students might do. So that's a mm. that's a fear I took before I started instructing. But um, because of that, I did go off and do some unusual attitudes training and so on to say, you know, if somebody does something really weird with the plane, mm. can I recover from it? And uh, no student has done anything remotely close to the unusual attitudes training. So I could say. It sort of put me, it let me know I could probably handle what was going to happen. And um, nobody's managed to do that yet. So <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Steve, um, I just looking at we've got a question here from yeah. one of the readers. Maybe we could cover that question. So this is from this is from He He Sun. And he asks, my instructor told me that the instrument rating is one of the hardest courses you can do in aviation. Uh, agree? Or do you agree? So who would like to tackle that question? I think that question was actually based at the instructor rating. Oh, is it? Oh, the instructor <laughs> rating is, oh, is that instructor rating is okay. All right, then maybe I read it wrong. So yeah, my instructor told me that the instructor rating is one of the hardest courses you can do in aviation. Do you agree? I think it depends on how much you remember from your CPL exam and from your PPL exam and how much of the, um, lift and thrust and drag and weight and you know what 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 side of his hair Bernoulli has his hair parted on um, <laughs> and if all of that comes to mind easily then fine but in my situation there was 16 years between doing PPL and my instructor rating as opposed to Amy who did it two hours before she started her instructor <laughs> so she had a really good grasp on all the all, all the concepts but I was starting from scratch pretty pretty much again, so I found it extremely challenging. Yeah, it also involves quite a amount of time. So uh, the RA instructor rating is not quite as extensive as the GA, but nevertheless, there is thirty hours of ground training and then twenty hours of flying. So it's not not simple and quick. It still takes quite a bit of concentration, and yeah. um, you know, there's a fair bit to put into it. So uh, um, I've. I, like Shelley, just had to relearn the theory that I hadn't, hadn't needed to sort of yes. be able to convey for 15 years. Yes. Um, so that did take some time and effort and concentration. Um, the flying bit was great. It was like going back to basics and being able to teach the basics again. So I did love that. But there's, again, lots to learn about how you do it. So, but it's, so there's an effort in there. Um, probably just depends a bit on the structure of it too and what opportunity you have because I imagine that's a bit different for all of us too. I was doing, you know, night theory once a week for several months to get through the ground theory. Um, but if you did it as a block or if you did it in another way, you'd have different time things to, I guess, to consider. So uh, all of that would be varied, I imagine. Yeah, I did mine um, two days a week for four months and so um and 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 every every week there was a massive amount of preparation i used to go wednesday morning till thursday night and there was a massive amount of preparation to get those briefs ready to write on the on, on the board those infernal bloody briefs yep <laughs> every every week and sometimes between a wednesday and a thursday <laughs> there would be another brief to do or in my case perhaps you'd like to redo that one that you did yesterday yeah. so i found that very very challenging because you, you just, really have to know your stuff amy you've been away just so you know the question was there was two yeah, questions sorry. one was is the instructor rating the hardest uh rating you do and there was another uh question here and it said amy show us the baby <laughs> oh, oh. Well, that's what I went. That's what I did go out to deal with a crying baby. But, 
So um, do you think it's the hardest rating you've done, uh, the instructor rating? What would oh, you say? Look, um, I have, so I, yeah, look, I, I've done my multi-engine and my instrument as well, um, and the instru of course the instructor rating. Uh, look, I, I think it's different. So I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't say it's the it's hardest. Um, I'd say that it's it's very different. Um, it requires, you know, a different. I mean, I want to say a different part of your brain, but um, but yeah, no. I think teaching is a very unique um, experience. I mean, for myself anyway. Like I, I, you know, I found it to be quite challenging in the sense that all of a sudden now I'm learning to fly in the right hand seat. Um, and, you know, and not just that, I'm also learning, um, you know, like I'm, I might know all this stuff about, um, you know, aerodynamics and, um, you know, the different parts of the engine and all that sort of stuff. But now it's about how do I convey that so that my student will understand it? And so I think um, in terms of hardest, I'd, I'd say, yeah, it, it, it is up there in terms of um, there's definitely is definitely is a lot of preparation involved um you know you would never you know go in um without having prepared something um and all you know so yeah so I think it, it's different um yeah it definitely requires you to um you know think on you know be on your feet because you you don't know I mean and, and I think um you know you often think well you, you don't know what your student's going to ask you know so you how can you prepare for that like it could be um you know, so for me, because I've, I've worked in public service, I'll often say to them, look, I'm not going to claim that I know everything just because I'm an instructor. Let me just take that on notice and I'll get back to you. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so, yeah, so it, it, is, it is very different to the other um, ratings that I've done, um, yeah, in that sense. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> we'll be your excuse if you have to run away again. Alex, what about, <laughs> what about you, Alex? Um, it's definitely one of the harder ratings that I've done because of all the um, preparation and the theory and um, the ground briefings. Like everybody has their different type of style. And so uh, I find that if you're, I, it's also funny, like I find it's very, the how I feel briefing an instructor who's teaching me how to do briefings versus briefing a student. Like I'm way more confident with students and I feel like I know what I'm talking about when I'm with an instructor who knows what like what knows what I'm briefing I almost get this like I don't know what I'm talking about anymore and they know more than me and they're like you know the all you know savior in the room and I I'm like turn into this little five-year-old unconfident little thing again <laughs> so it's yeah I feel like um very true yeah, Marlon, yeah. I, can see you, I can see you nodding your head, Marlon, as well. What's, <laughs> what's, your, what's your thinking about this? Uh, look, it, it is, I mean, harder than um, some of the other ratings. I'm not saying it's the hardest one. But the other thing is um, you, you learn on the way. Like, mm. after you become, when you're a grade three junior instructor, I remember my time uh, as a grade three junior, um, you know, you know the stuff, but you you really didn't know how to teach the way the student would understand it. Mm, you were yeah. almost like delivering what you learned. And then as you get gain experience, you, you find your own little methods of teaching. And, um, you know, so yeah, it, it's a journey, I'd say. And it's practice. So the more you do the briefs, like now Absolutely. you could rattle off the effects of controls brief in your sleep. But yes. when you're first doing it, it's like, um, Oh, I think the cyclic, or I think this control does this. Oh, yeah, that like definitely happens. Oh, wait, I just need to double check with my book. Oh, yeah, no, that does happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Steve, um, have you got some more questions, or would you like to do some of the questions what, from the might, readers? What would you like to do, Steve? I think we might go through some of the um, the, uh, the the comments, the very yeah. good questions that some of the readers yes. have come up with here. Yeah. However, Paul, what I might get you to do, yes. um, for some reason, I'm, my Facebook page has only shown me the last five comments made. Okay. More than that. So yeah. uh, some of these, um, I will, one more I'll ask uh, from memory. Yeah. And that was uh, at the moment due to COVID-19, a lot of pilots are returning to the instructor game at the moment that were once um, that were once um, in yeah. charter careers or in airline careers or so forth now. Um, and I'll aim this one at Marlon. Um, Marlon, do you think that this is restricting opportunities for newer instructors to enter the field? Um, 
Look, I, I honestly don't think so. I look, I know it's a uh, um, you know, the demand is almost not there in the airline industry at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that makes it difficult for many. But um, I honestly think it's not, and not only that for instructors, for someone who wants to get into aviation and to become a pilot for a young 18 year old uh, person or someone, I think, I honestly think this is the best opportunity right now mm-hmm. because the, the aviation industry will pick up. It'll take two, three, you know, four years. And when the demand is there, um, if you start now, you'll be ready then. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, look, we are in this little, um, you know, bad patch and uh, I'm sure we'll, get to the other side very soon so I don't think it's a bunch of a thing to worry about. Mm. Yeah and St- Steve if I could just add look I think the readers can tell that we've got a very fine group of instructors here tonight who have you know oh, are people who really care. <laughs> oh, thanks, no, no really that you're people who really you really care p- passionately about about your students and we've made reference to that isn't always the way and I get calls almost every week from schools looking for instructors, but they're not just looking for instructors, they're looking for good instructors. And they look, and they always tell me they're looking for instructors who have the students good at heart and that they, they want to be instructors because they want to teach, not because they want to build ours. So I think in answer to that question, Steve, I would say that, you know, for that reader is if you're a good instructor and a genuine instructor with a genuine interest in people and instructing, mm. the jobs will find you. The jobs are there, and I know they're there because I get calls from schools wanting inst- good instructors. And at the end of the day, I think instructing is also a little bit used as a stepping stone for people to get their hours, as well as caring about students. So it's it's a, a ever-growing industry that always has people dropping off the other end and need people to kind of fill the gaps. So there's always a need for instructors. Mm. Yeah. Steve, can you see some of the other questions there? There was um, there was one about there was an interesting one about whether uh, RA instructing and 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 CASA instructing will either be combined into one. I'm not sure if that's a question easy for our instructors to answer. Maybe you could ask that answer that, Steve. That was a question that someone had asked. I think that was that was that Daniel White that asked that one. I think it was actually. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Dan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love the answer to be yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the one day is I don't see why not. Um, I think the difference at the moment, of course, is to be a GA instructor, unless you are a, a specialist instructor in certain design features of an aircraft, you need to have a CPL, even though you don't have to have a class one medical anymore. RAOs, you, you don't need to be at that level. I guess that's because in RA there is no... CPL, so to speak. Mm. Um, but my gut feeling is I've seen instructors cross back and forward between GA and RA. Um, Murray, uh, Murray, Paul, you know my instructor, Murray? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Much time and recreational as he does flying caravans. Um, and he's a, a, gr- a great instructor on all of these things. And I think it gets back to what we were talking about. A good instructor is a good instructor. Um, the, the knowledge of the aeroplane is, is uh, a, different, a different thing. But what we're, we're talking about here is a regulatory issue, is the whether CAS is ever going to allow that sort of thing to happen. Look, it'd be great. I think it'd be fantastic um, if people teaching to PPL level didn't necessarily have to have a CPL. I don't believe that it brings about a lessening of standards, of flight standards. Um, I don't advocate that PPLs would ever teach to a CPL level. That would be just crazy. Um, so I don't see why not one day, but I think that day is an attitude away. Mm. And Amy, you teach both. You're, you're an RA instructor. And uh, what's your view on this, Amy? Yeah, look, um, the schools that I have taught at um, with you know RA, um, it, they've um, because they do both GA and RA. It, it's it's they've kept the kept they've kept it the same basically. So um, you know 
uh, with the RA students and the GA students, we do the same briefings. Um, we just fly different aeroplanes, basically. Um, so it then comes down to, um, you know, how to actually fly the aeroplane rather than all the other stuff, you know, around the briefings and all that, um, you know, manoeuvres and all that, and because um, they're all essentially um, very similar. Um, yeah, so look, I mean, for myself, I think it would be great to see them, um, see it come together and why not just have one standard, um, one across the board and everyone does the same thing rather than have two, um, mind you, I won't name the school, but um, one school that I did my RA conversion at, um, it was funny because the CFI of that school who did my conversion, um, when I turned up and had all my briefings ready and my checklist, he sort of, he looked at me and said, what briefings? Checklist? No, forget about all that. <laughs> so, um, and so I, you know, I was actually really surprised. And and he he said, oh yeah, no, we just jump in and let's go, um, you know. And so I, and so he sort of laughed and we had a joke about it. And he said, oh look, you know, you can teach me what what briefings are all about. And um, so I think, but I think, I mean, that was a while back now, 2010, that I did my RA conversion. Um, but yeah, so I think a lot has changed over time in that RA have now come, um, have, gr have they've grown a lot, and you know, and they're now aligning themselves to the GA requirements, like you know, the briefings, and so I, yeah, so I really can't see why not in the future, um, yeah, for for the for us to have the one. Um, I mean, and that's something that I'd like to see as well. Yes, I think you're right, Amy. I um, in the last couple of years, I did the the LSA training in the US to get a US LSA license on the Icon A5, and and just a couple of weeks ago, I flew with Linda to get my RAOs uh, in Australia, and uh, I was very impressed with the standards. Um, and I think RAOs has proven, you know, integrity is proven over time. They've proven over time that they run a very good operation with very good yeah. training. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I would say that the RAOs instructors teach the basics really well, uh, really well. Um, and, and, you know, it's really good stick and rudder skills. And, you know, no matter where you go in aviation, you need really good stick and rudder skills. So, look, I think it's a great question. And let's hope somebody from CAS is watching this and, and they pick up the message that we think the standard of RA instructors is very, very good. Well, can I just add, sorry, can I just add that um, it would also save um, instructors some money as well? Because I actually had to pay for my own RA horse conversion. So if we just had the one, that definitely would, um, you know, save everyone money. Steve, it's um, 8.16 and we like to finish at 8.30. So if it's okay with you, Steve, what I'd like to do is just move to our last question, which is, what advice would each of you as instructors have for people who are thinking about an instructing career? Um, who, would like to, who would like to go first? I can go first. Okay, Shelley, go ahead. Because um, I'm really, really, I just know, I just know what I, in my heart what I want to, how I want to answer this question. Good. And I just want to tell people that they just need to do it for the love of it. Oh, absolutely. Lord I agree. Knows you're not going to do it for the money. We all know that. So you need to do it for the love, and 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 as as almost all of us have have um, said tonight, it's got to be whatever's whatever's the right thing for that student. We, if if that student is happy, then then I'm happy. I, I often watch, you know, there might be a farmer that pulls up in his uh, up in his ute outside the aero club, and I know that, that that he's probably really nervous because this is his first nav, and 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 I think about now. He's got those two little kids at home and God, that must've been hard for him. So we go through the process and we go through the day and then, and then, I, you know, he, I might walk back out to the car with him and, and I, I resolutely put my, put myself in his shoes or in her shoes at the beginning of the day when I first see them and at the end of the day and think, okay, have I done have I prepared you the best we can for this day? And have I given you the best possible experiences this day? But you've got to really care about, about the person that's sitting next to you because it's a, it's a, it's a huge thing they're doing. You know, it's a, it's a massive thing. They're paying hundreds of dollars an hour to do, to do this thing. And, and, it's a, and it's a happy, happy, amazing, amazing um, hobby or would be career that that you're uh, that, that that you're giving them access to. That's an enormous privilege. God, 
I just think it's so, yeah. so you gotta love it. You gotta love it. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Marlon, I won't have you last this time. You can go next, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, but, Marlon? What advice would you give to people thinking look, about instructing? So it, it, it's a great opportunity. Um, I mean, you know, and and I always um, tell when I'm mentoring junior instructors as well, um, it, it's something that um, you can really enjoy and it's very rewarding. And in a way, lifestyle-wise, it's pretty easy as well. You know, you can almost come home for dinner almost every day of the week. Um, and, you know, you don't need to be a thousand miles away from, you know, the, the closest township and working in a, you know, 40 year old aircraft, you know, so th there are really good things about it. But, and, you know, as I think Alex mentioned, you know, th this can be a stepping stone for your aviation career. Now, that's fine. You all understand it. And there's not much money in it, to be honest with you, at least when you start. Uh, but what I'm saying all the time, what I'm telling my other instructors is like, do an honest, reasonable job and then move on if that's what you want. Mm. You know, while you're at it, just, you know, don't waste your client's time and money. And uh, in, and look, honestly, um, a lot of us are doing it right. So, yeah, that's probably my advice for anyone who wants to start. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, what about you, Amy? What advice would you give for people thinking about instructing? Yeah, look, um, I will echo the likes of Shelley and Marlon um, as well. I can say, you know, I mean, for me, all of my students know that, um, you know, I love what I do. Um, and, you know, I do find it to be very rewarding. And, you know, and, and I am true and I am a true believer of, um instructing being something it's it's very unique so it's almost like if you don't love it it's very hard to say in it um and also if you don't love it um it shows so you know so i i you know um i have had students um you know tell me you know about some instructors who are just doing it for our building and and I'm always surprised as to how they can tell, but I think there is a, a demeanor about you um, that does resonate with the student when it's not coming from the heart and, you know, a, a, a sense of sincerity. Um, so look, I, you know, so the advice that I would have is, yeah, to really um, uh, make sure it is that something that you want to do, um, well, whether or not you want to use it as a stepping stone or not, um, is, is, you know, entirely up to you. I mean, like if, if you, like Marlon said, if you wanted to use it as a stepping stone, um, at least try to enjoy it um, for the short period that you're there um, for, you know, try not to uh, sort of just take it on the cheap um, kind of sort of thing. Um, yeah, and look, yeah, and, and for me, um, I never thought I'd be a mum while <laughs> um, while being an instructor as well, but I am. And, um, yeah, so I, I do say, look, it is, you know, look, I, I used to look at women who have kids already and think, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? These women are amazing. You know, they they've they have kids and they're doing this. And, um, and I think, you know, if you need to take a break, um, like myself, I've you know it took me six years to do my CPL, and I've had breaks in between, and and then I had another another six months um, with my baby, and I don't know how how much longer before I return, but um, but yeah, look, you know, if it's something that you want to do, um, then definitely go for it, whether it's um, instructing or you know just as a hobby, um, definitely yeah, go for it. Thanks, Amy, Linda. Um, I think definitely it's worthwhile. Uh, we had a great moment a couple of years back when our oldest and our youngest student both did their first solo on the same day. And the youngest student was 15 and the oldest was 78. And it was just such an amazing oh, wow. end of wow. the experience of the students, mm. let alone us, have them both standing there going, yep, we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's why, that's what we're there for, I suppose. Well, that's the privilege of it is sharing the, sharing the joy of the achievement with the students. Um, it is, it doesn't pay well, but it does pay you back finally for flying. So, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where suddenly you can turn around and you're not having to shelve out for those hours that you're now doing, they're paying you back for that. So, you know, while it's, uh, it's not gonna get you rich doing instructing, I don't think, um, it gives you, it is a good lifestyle. You can generally choose how much time you put into it depends a bit on where you're working. Um, 
it does keep you current. You have the joy of sitting there with students. You have the challenge of uh, extending yourself all the time, which is just something I look for in a job all the time anyway. Um, and it just enhances the quality of your own flying, let alone other people. So many, many reasons why flying instructing is a good thing. Thank you, Linda. And what about you, Alex? What, what would you say to people thinking about an instructing career? Oh my gosh, how can I follow that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I agree with everybody um, on the panel. Like it's, uh, it's an incredibly rewarding experience. I would advise um, that it's not uh, something to take lightly um, because uh, you're teaching someone how to become a pilot. Mm. So, um, and, and as everybody knows, um, piloting can be an incredibly um, safety, I guess, risk, uh, risky business. So um, I think it's important to, uh, if, you, if one is looking to do instructing, uh, to really um, knuckle, knuckle down and uh, try to gain as much knowledge um, as possible uh, before you actually go into your um, flight instructor exam. Um, because yeah, once you get your ticket, now you're in charge of somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. Yeah. Can I just add that um, for me anyway, I feel like it's uh, emotionally for me, I feel as though it's, I liken it to a bit of, um, I liken it to like volunteering because I do volunteering as well. And, you know, that feel good feeling um, that you get from volunteering, um, you know, when you are finally able to, you know, enjoy or we'll see that student go solo and celebrate with them so it's that feel good feeling of being able to um you know walk side by side with your students and you know watch them achieve their goals and be happy with them and for them um yeah so that gives me that kick <laughs> like, yes um, yeah so yeah like i feel like it's a victory when um i'm standing there and my students doing their first like oh, cir yeah. like circuit and i feel like almost absolutely. the mother you know going yes. like oh my god like, <laughs> they managed to yeah i taught them that type so, yeah steve would you like to make some closing closing comments before yeah, we look, finish I'd like to expand a little well not expand but just add something to that with a very very quick story there's a bloke who flies uh, with my flying club is a, a private pilot and a very 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 good private pilot and his instructor said to me one day, listen, I love doing this bloke's BFR because every time I come back, he's taught me something new. So my question is, do you guys learn from your students and does it make you better pilots? 100%. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All the time. You're learning all the time. And then like students, they are going through their own... Um, like, or they're, you know, uh, doing their navigation, they're doing their human performance, and they ask a question, and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And then they go through, um, I don't know, they come at you with some new type of knowledge from, like, their own careers. And you're like, oh, I never thought about it that way. Mm. Or, oh, I learned something new today. Like, even if it's not, you know, flying, mm. you still learn yeah. all the time. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, same way, like, I learn a lot of um, methods of teaching from a student. Like sometimes I spend half an hour trying to teach some a student one way. And then it's like, oh, is that what you mean? Like, is it this? Then I'm like, yeah, yeah sure. That's that's what it is. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I should remember that way for the next time. <laughs> Look, uh, um, yeah, talking about, talking sorry, about achievements, um, I, I, if I can just share this story um, about one of the students who did his um, PPL on his 17th birthday last year. Um, you know, that was, and as Linda said, you know, um, having two students, one 78 year old and the young one doing that, that was a good achievement. But this is, was my, probably the highlight of my career so far. Um, you know, we, I, I got him through first solo RPL and then we were like, well, we're going to have to wait for you to turn 17 for your PPL, <laughs> you know. And then, um, yeah, I spoke with his, his dad and, um, and him um, and um, um we planned it very well and executed perfectly with all the challenges with COVID and shutdowns and everything um, to, a, to a point. And, uh, you know, it was at the end, it was left for the weather to see whether he's going to go ahead or not. And then, you know, luckily the weather was perfect. And this kid, Ethan, he was um, 
he is very good as well. Like he got hundred percent for his PPO um, CASA exam written wow. exam, so he was nice. he was good. And yeah, like for me, that was like yeah, that's it. I mean, I'm sure <laughs> he'll remember his PPO for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, we've got two minutes, so I'll wrap it up now, or apparently Paul Southwick turns into a pumpkin or something like that. <laughs> Listen, thanks everyone oh, really? for that. Thanks for thanks for being with us tonight. Some really, really good insights there. Amy, thanks for sparing a bit of time away from your newborn. No worries. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Shelly, thanks for putting up with all that traffic between Camden and Sydney to be back here right on time. Brilliantly done. No problem. It was lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. You really do need your own personal helicopter, Shell. I know, I know, I know. I might, you know, I might, just, I might speak to Dick Smith. He just lives up the road. Perhaps he's <laughs> the one or two that he can lend me. A spare one he's not using. Yeah. 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 Speaking yeah. of helicopters, thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Really Thank you for having me. Tonight from the, the, the Rotary World. I think it really added something to it. And, uh, <laughs> and Marlon, thanks for stepping in at the very last minute. Thank you. Um, I know it was last minute, and uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed um, it. It's good to have a, a head of operations, yeah, someone so experienced as yourself coming in. Yeah. And I would finish off tonight by giving all these instructors here a bit of advice. I hope they've been swallowed. I'm what I call a professional private pilot. <laughs> there is such a thing. One thing that's important to me out there is that the instructor teaches me to have fun with the aeroplane, not just teach it by rote or anything. Teach me how to have fun with the aeroplane. If they do that, I keep on coming back, which is why I've had the same instructor for many years now, because I've never known another bloke who knows how to have that much fun with an aeroplane um, in my entire flying career. Paul Southwick, thanks, mate. Thank you. And look, my concluding comment would be that I think the students, the flight students of Australia are in very good hands. Agreed. Agreed. I think the instruction stand is very high. So thank you, everybody. We'll sign off now and uh, we'll do Thanks another Facebook Live uh, soon. Okay. Thanks for thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.